Thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here. Could I have all of you hold up your phones really fast? Just hold up, hold up your phones really quickly here. Great. Oh, that's a nice one. It's a great. I haven't seen that one in a long time. All right. The the faster you held them up, the more cyborg you are. Uh, some of you are more reluctant cyborgs than others. But the idea behind the word cyborg is not that we're Terminator or Robocop. It's that every time you interact with a piece of technology, you add it to yourself temporarily to adapt to a new environment. That makes you a cyborg. The word cyborg came from a 1960 paper on space travel. And the term was an organism to which some extra attachments uh, have, been, have been given so that you can adapt. And that's what humans do. Since the beginning of humanity, we have had tools and evolved outside of ourselves and created these new tools to adapt to these new spaces. A cyborg anthropologist, this is a, a field of study from 1993 that I found when I was in college, uh, looks at the interaction between humans and technology and how technology affects culture. Cultural theorist Douglas Rushkoff would say that we are living in a present shock, not a future shock. We're trying right now to even make sense of our present moment uh, while it tries to catch up with us. And so having even a framework to say, what does it mean when we wake up next to our phones every morning? What does it mean when we go to sleep next to them as well? When they cry and we have to pick them up and soothe them back to sleep? When we have to plug them in and feed them? And when we take better care of them than ourselves sometimes, and we interact with them instead of interacting with other people. What does that mean and where is that taking us? I can't provide all of the answers to the questions here, but I can provide some historical perspective. When I was writing my thesis on mobile phones, right when the iPhone came out, I found this theory of calm technology, which I'll explain to you now. There's this quote that a lot of technologists really like to say, that 50 billion devices will be online by 2020. I don't know if that's a great idea. How many of you have a very good experience with technology? We were told that technology would free our time and allow us to have more moments with each other. But now it seems like technology is a gas that expands to fill every single little moment in our lives. And the question is, how do we get our time back and how do we have a better relationship with our technology? And what does it mean to have a quality life? So if we have this many devices online, I like to ask whenever we have these, this data, does this actually sound good? Does this actually mean something? Uh, so I like to consider different scenarios, like the smart watch that gives you the same notifications on your wrist as on your phone. And you have to, uh, you have to be very careful about which notifications you get sent to you. Or the smart fridge. There are so many United States technology co uh, companies that want me to help build a smart fridge. And I tell them, why do we need a smart fridge? You know, we have dumb cupboards. I store all of my sweets in the dumb cupboard. And they say, well, let's have a thumbprint reader so that you can thumbprint into your fridge. I say, well, when I'm cooking, my hands are dirty. I don't want to put a thumbprint onto a fridge. I have a lock on my door. That's enough. I say, well, maybe there's a, a plan that only you can eat certain items. I said, well, all the items I'll keep in this cupboard. They're not going to be in my fridge, all the bad items. So I keep trying to tell people that we don't need to put things in everything. As the founder of Calm Technology says, we don't need smarter devices. We need smarter people. What are we doing putting intelligence into devices and removing intelligence from ourselves? It doesn't make us feel good. It doesn't allow us to be innovative. When you put everything together, you get what I like to call the dystopian kitchen of the future. Everything speaks a different programming language. Everything has its own support plan. Everything is getting attacked by uh, hackers. Uh, it's taking up more bandwidth than you trying to stream a video online, because none of these are written with great code. It's very wasteful. And then finally, everything is giving you a different uh, alert that's not compatible. Imagine having to sell your house and inherit this kitchen from somebody else and try to set up all the new accounts. So when you think about, this is a funny scenario, but when people start to rely on this technology, uh, things can go wrong. This is a, a startup that said, 
You can leave your pet at home. We will automatically feed and water your animal. And you could Skype the animal and see it uh, when you're away. Never worry about feeding your animal again. So the problem is that this relied on an external server. They were so excited to get this product to the market and the promise that it would be functional technology that they forgot to implement offline support. And this means that uh, one day the server went down and the connected pets uh, ended up starving. Um, uh, so this was kind of this new Schrodinger's cat. People didn't know whether the pets were alive or dead. They trusted the technology to feed the pets, and they had to break in and get their pets. Now, this is a situation that is kind of okay if it's an animal, but if it's a human and somebody dies because of it, there's not really a lot of consumer protection or trying to figure out the right way to implement the technology so that if it goes wrong, we're still okay. A lot of the technology that's made today is made in these perfect scenarios in a conference room in San Francisco where you have very good Wi-Fi, very good battery life, the latest technology, and nothing gets hacked. The real world has none of these things. The real world, you have a tiny bit of battery life before you get home, and you have all of the apps on your phone wasting the battery life. You have one bar of energy, or one bar of, uh, of network connection, it's, things are very slow. You have an app that has been hacked because you have a bad password, and then you don't have any attention because everything else is trying to take your attention. So if we work towards building applications and technology that works in bad scenarios, in scenarios that are not optimal, we will have better technology for everybody. It's just hard to convince people right now that that's the kind of technology to build, and that's also the technology that will make the most money because so many more people will be able to use it. I looked at the terms of service of PetNet. It said, PetNet is not responsible for service failures, even though it said you never have to worry about your pet again, and it said you agree that you will not rely on the services for any safety or critical purposes related to you or your pet. Uh, this should be illegal. There should be a warning on connected devices that says, this will probably break, but there's nothing yet. We have an era of interruptive technology. Our own attention is interrupted, battery life, network, security. We need the opposite. We need an era, instead of interruptive technology, a calm technology. What does a calm technology look like? Something where you use the technology and you're not angry at it constantly. The calmest technology is boring. A washer and dryer that you barely notice. A tea kettle that just works and you forget it. Something that's classic, that's been around for a long time that you don't have to worry about repairing. Something that if the lights aren't turned on, you know where the buttons are because it's easy to use. A light switch. Invisible technology like electricity is there when you need it, not when you don't. It works, and when it fails, you notice, but it barely ever, ever fails. When I was writing my thesis, I found these two people at Xerox Park, Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown. Uh, Mark Weiser uh, died and wasn't around to see the era that he predicted, and I feel like it's my responsibility to talk about the era he predicted and try to bring his vision forward. He said that at one point in the future, instead of having many people share one device, one large computer, will have many devices sharing each of us. And at that point in time, the scarce resource won't be attention, or it won't be technology. Technology will be very cheap. The scarce resource will be our attention. And the technology that makes the best use of our attention will be the best technology, because that's the thing we won't have the most of. There's a paper that talks about this, The Coming Age of Calm Technology, and another paper that was very good called the world is not a desktop. In the desktop world, in front of a desktop computer, you had all the attention you wanted. You could sit here, you could do a task for a long time, you never had to worry about battery life, but the world has changed and now we have continuous partial attention. We, don't, we are not able to fully be in a moment because we could get interrupted at any time. So we are continuously shifting our focus around. It becomes dangerous when you're driving a car. This is one of the quotes from Mark Weiser. He says, a good tool becomes invisible, and not by invisible that it disappears. You focus on the task and not the tool. 
A book is a, re a great example of this. A book, when well written enough, you dissolve into. You forget that you're reading a book. You care about the characters in the book more than you do your next door neighbor. And the way that the book is made is that it's calm. All of the complexity is folded into itself, and there's a spine. It's portable. You don't have to charge it. It always stays uh, okay. You can spill coffee on it, and it's cheap to reproduce. You don't have to worry about upgrading your book. So it's a stable technology. So how do we design calm technology? Um, when I was looking at some of this, there were some principles that were set forth to design things that work well alongside us, not cause us to become angry or try to replace us. Uh, we don't have enough resources to replace everybody with robots. And do you really want to automate um, getting married or raising children or, or falling in love or listening to music? I don't think so. Like There are some things that we should never automate. There, there are, there's not even enough resources to do it. The first principle is that technology shouldn't require all of our attention, just some of it and only when necessary. It's very difficult to say this in an era where a lot of our technology is based on advertising and requires our attention. But there are so many other industries out there, like factories um, and uh, all, all, like, um, like if you're in a, in a supermarket or if you're at a counter trying to order something, it shouldn't take all of your attention to do a task. It should just require your attention when necessary. Uh, a tea kettle is a good example. You set it, you forget it, it tells you when it's done. You don't have to sit there watching it. If a tea kettle were invented today, it would have this crazy panel and you'd press like 10 different buttons. You'd have to Bluetooth it to your phone. It would try to give you a, a, a trend over time about how much you've boiled your tea and then it would sell it to Facebook so you could make some money. <laughs> Technology should empower the periphery. The peripheral, our peripheral attention is, is enormous. Everything right now is so focused on vision. We are all so visual. We forget that we have a sense of touch, we have hearing, and hearing goes all around our head and even far away. Um, how do we use different senses? How do we load the information into different senses so that we can stay attuned to what we're doing and not be distracted? The example of a car is very simple. Everything about a car is supporting your primary focus so that you can calculate where the cars are on the road and make good decisions, well-informed decisions. You don't have to look at the pedal. You press it with your foot. It's using an appendage that you don't usually use. You're using your foot. You have a stick. You have the rear view mirror that you can glance back and forth. And this glanceability using your peripheral attention is key to calm technology. This is a silly example, but this is the Lumo back posture sensor. It just notices whenever you slouch. I see you sitting up for a street. It notices when you slouch and buzzes you. But it's not telling everybody that you're slouching. It's not giving you a notification on your phone. I had an employee that had an insulin pump installed um, because he was diabetic. And he was so excited to get the insulin pump installed. But then I had a meeting with him, and he beeped. And he was so upset. I said, can you change the alert? And he said, no, it just beeps. So I've been at a wedding, I've been at a funeral, I've been in a movie theater, and I beep and everybody thinks my phone is on and that I'm being very rude. And then when I'm at a loud concert, it beeps and I can't hear it, which is life-threatening for me. It's an insulin pump. I need to know when to refill the insulin. So he has to set a secondary alarm on his phone that goes off and buzzes so that he can fill his insulin. The whole point of the thing was to be more human and to not be as obviously uh, diabetic. But it failed because a lot of times when we build this new technology, we build it as if it's for a desktop computer. We don't consider that people might have different experiences in different contexts with it. So if you're building something, make sure to allow people to change the notification style to suit their needs. We can't predict what context people will be in. Technology should inform and in calm at the same way. You should be able to get a lot of information in a, in a calm way. Um, this is a simple example of my old house. This is a light bulb connected to a weather report, and all it does is changes color based on what the weather is going to be for the day. That's it. 
If you've seen these videos about these big technology companies that have the disembodied human voice that wakes the person up in the morning, like, hello Dave, today's weather is... Da -da -da. Yeah, who wants to wake up to a disembodied computer voice reading the news to you? Nobody wants this. It only works in an advertisement. What people really want is, I walk into my kitchen in the morning, I live in a place that rains most of the time, and this morning it was yellow, and I knew it was going to be sunny, and I jumped up and down with joy, and then I looked at the iPad on the wall to get more information. It's about using a very low resolution indicator, and then allowing somebody to choose whether they want higher resolution information. And it's not using the auditory channel, it's just using feeling, this kind of ambient awareness. Technology should amplify the best of what humans can do and what computers can do. A human, we are very good at curation, understanding context, understanding feeling and emotion, making weird things that people like, composing music, building Stradivarius violins. Try to get a computer to do that. It's going to make it perfect and it won't sound the same way. When you see the, when you see the sound waves, they'll be perfect looking. They won't be these real, beautiful, resonant tones that give us emotion. That's missing when you try to automate things. What is a computer good at? A computer is really good at taking a large data set and finding patterns, taking what was formerly invisible, making it visible, being able to see a trend over time and tell us that there might be a trend there. But it's not good at completely modeling reality. There will always be some pieces missing. What humans and technology are good at is working together. Humans can vote whether a system has done a good job and it will improve the system over time. So if you think about predicting cancer, you can have a tissue sample and you can have a computer read it and say, here's the readout, there's a likelihood of cancer, then the doctor can say, yes, this was this kind of cancer. That goes back into the system and you get a feedback loop. That will outperform any single standalone AI system that's made outside. And it will also outperform any single doctor or group of doctors because it's humans and technology working together, side by side, helping each other, not trying to replace each other. We need technology to live. Technology needs us to live. Every time you try to make a computer that acts like a human, it's incredibly awkward. It also makes us sound like a machine. If you try to use Siri and you don't have the perfect San Francisco accent, you end up saying something to it again and again and again. You end up sounding like a robot. You end up being the one on pause. If you look at Google, you type something into Google, robots behind the scenes are indexing results, and it will show you not one thing, but it will show you a list of items and you make the choice. It's going through millions of pages for you, which is what a computer's good at. But you are making the end choice, and that's the difference. There's only so much a computer can do, and only so much a human can do. And you blend them both together, and you get a harmony. You don't get robots destroying humans and the, the, these nightmare dystopian science fiction worlds. It's very exciting to think about dystopian science fiction worlds, but there are plenty of functional technologies out there right now. They're just really boring. We don't even think that we're interacting with hundreds of thousands of robots when we use Google. But there are hundreds of thousands of robots on the web right now. They just don't look like humans. They're just out there doing an invisible job. This is my friend Todd Huffman's uh, tissue sample scanning robot. What he decided is that it takes a really long time for a human They'll, they'll, a human will get a degree in biology and then they will spend years preparing tissue samples and scanning them two-dimensionally. So he said, why are these people who got this PhD stuck in a lab for years doing this incredibly boring task? Why aren't they doing cancer research? Why aren't they coming up with the, experi uh, the experiments to create the new systems, to create the new insights? So he made a robot that you put a three-dimensional tissue sample in it takes a diamond knife and scans and cuts at the same time, uploads it to a database, and then you have a feedback loop that's able to tell with greater and greater accuracy whether this will become a tumor or not and what kind of tumor it will become with a network of doctors. Now all of these people are freed up because this machine is 1,500 times faster than a human. All of the postdoctoral researchers can now work on real 
work. Actually, they're probably just working on some other boring thing that hasn't been automated yet. Uh, but they are more free to do things that will push us along in medicine faster. This is where automation goes right. It's not the dystopian scenario. It's this very simple feedback loops. We've lost the idea of cybernetics and feedback, but it's really what's working a lot. We might have this idea of AI, but we had AI in the 80s and the 90s and the 60s, and we had AI winters where the extreme excitement of AI wore out because it, it wasn't the perfect thing we expected. You can have perfection in a film. You can have perfection in science fiction. You can have perfection in theory. But n nature is not perfect. We're not perfect. If we embrace our flaws, then we can build really interesting things. Um, in Star Trek, you don't have a spaceship with one kind of human because then they would get attacked and everybody would die. There is a bridge composed of many different types of humans. Humans, non-humans, different creatures, different species. And because of that, every time the ship gets attacked, there's some resiliency. If we don't have that in the future, it's over. We don't have a chance. We can't be a one-size-fits-all culture. We can't be a templated self. Technology can communicate, but it doesn't need to speak. Um, this is an example of a, an art project uh, on Mark Weiser's team. It's just a piece of string attached to the web, the local network they had at Xerox Park. And whenever something interesting was happening, the string would whir around, and people would hear it, and they'd come running and see what people were working on. It's like a new version of a water cooler. It was just a cute little thing. Um, but if you think about different indicators, the Roomba robotic vacuum cleaner is cute. It's not trying to do everything for a person. It doesn't look like a human. It looks like a trilobite, a prehistoric filter fe uh, feeder. When it's done, it goes dun da da da, and when it's stuck, it goes dun dun. That's it. Everything you need to know is in those two tones. It's not a human voice that says, hello, I'm done cleaning the floor. Can you imagine? Not only would that be dumb, but you would have to translate it into 200 languages or however many markets you wanted to go into, and you'd have to hire a person to speak that or have a really gross voice. You can hear this tone from another room. You know it's dumb. People love R2-D2 and don't like C-3PO as much because R2-D2 speaks in these tones. When we try to engineer these assistive machines and have it have a human voice, we expect to be able to interact with it like a human. A C-3PO might know 200,000 languages, but he's annoying in every single language. <laughs> technology should consider social norms. It's not, that, uh, it's not that technology isn't ready for us. We're usually the ones that are not ready for technology. When the elevator first came out, people were afraid to ride it. They'd never been accelerated that fast in that direction before. The same with the train. It took a bunch of adventurous people to get into that first train and that first elevator to see if they would be smashed. We had to artificially slow down elevators because they were too quick. Because again, we can develop all the technology we want, but there's a kind of metabolism, a digestion rate of humanity for how long it takes us to accept a new thing. So when you make a new product, you have to see where it fits in. And you can't just release 20 features. You have to do one at a time. If you think of the iPhone, it took like 15 years to get from an iPod to the phone we have now. We couldn't have even purchased this crazy giant phone with a network. We had to wait for that long to eat this kind of dinner with an appetizer and a main course and a dessert. It had to be cut up into small pieces for us to accept. Everything that we have right now is a norm. Everybody in the room has a phone with a video camera in it. Fifteen years ago, this would be terrifying. We thought that privacy was dead. We wrote articles about how everyone has cameras now. It's over. We use a camera to take pictures of our food before we eat it as a pre-digestive ritual. This is now, what, what have we done? Um, but it took a couple years, three or four years, for this to become a part of everyday life, to know that you hold up your phone and you take a photo, and that you could duck away if you didn't want to be in the photo. But that norm invisibility line is there. Anything that gets you to that norm, that current norm, is restorative. 
So eyeglasses are considered normal or even decorative. Prosthetic legs are restorative. They take you to that norm. Anything above that norm is enhanced, advanced technology, and that's what causes people fear. That's where Robocop, Terminator, and Google Glass show up. This is why people rejected Google Glass. It was the first time we had something that we could wear here that had too many features. When you have 15 features, people focus on the scariest one, which is video recording. Uh, not to mention that it had 15 minutes of battery life if you video recorded that long. You can't tell somebody that when they react out of fear. You can't, you can't negotiate with somebody who's in a fearful state. And so out of the box, it was very easy to tell that this system would fail. And it's really easy to tell now when people come up with these products that they will fail immediately because they don't even care to research where we are and how comfortable we are with a certain technology. Finally, the right amount of tech is the minimum to solve the problem. Every new feature you add to a piece of technology is something you have to support. I, I like the quote before, to allow something to be a classic, to allow something to be old-fashioned, means that it's stable enough to be that long-lived. Wouldn't it be great if we had a phone as a family heirloom that we passed down every 40 years? That it was that stable? That we didn't have to buy one every year? I mean, it seems impossible now. But this is how the world was. We would have furniture and houses and clothing and homes that we would pass from generation to generation. And now we have something that we have to buy every year or it turns against us and makes our lives slower. I like these technologies because they're boring. The street lights are just a light indicator. It's punctuation for your commute. And this toilet occupied sign on a plane, even if you're red, green, colorblind, this is the sign that never changes on the plane. Everything else changes, Wi-Fi and turbulence and seatbelt, everything. But this doesn't change. It's a pictogram. You don't have to translate it. It's just there. It's part of the plane. These boring things are what I look out for. I want to make successfully boring technology that doesn't have to change. That would be amazing. Also, it would be profitable. It doesn't have to not make any money. Everybody would have to have it. And then finally, technology should make use of the near and the far. How many of you, if you turn your phone to airplane mode, can actually use anything on the phone anymore, except for notes and a camera? Remember on a desktop computer, everything that you did on that computer was self-contained? Now it seems ridiculous that we would have a desktop computer. Um, but when we are in situations where we don't have a lot of network access, having everything on your phone is really important because then you have all of your data. So what if, when you went to a doctor, all of the data from the doctor was stored with you? And if you wanted new data, you could ask for new data, and you could share your information with that server for a limited period of time until you got the diagnosis, and then it would be stored to your file. That way, if somebody hacked into the system, they would only have access to just what was shared in that moment and not everybody's files. If we flip these things around, we see our problems right now with security and connectivity are that we expect companies to provide a very crucial function and also be experts in security. We can't do this because everything is too exciting for people to hack into. It's all just sitting there. You, you access one part and you get everybody's data, 500 million Yahoo accounts. No big deal. But if we had the opposite way, we would own the data first and then we'd be able to share it. I made this chart and I'm not sure if, if it makes any sense, but the idea is that early we had computers far away from us. We had a mainframe at a college that we would go visit and we would share some time on it. Then the technology was close to us. We had a desktop computer in the home and all of our stuff was with us. Then we started to have uh, the web and this cloud and then we started to store everything in the cloud and now it's really far away and it's incredibly insecure. So what if we take it back down this curve and store it with us? We have plenty of capability to do that. It just depends on where we are. This could be the next generation of the web and decentralized distributed computing. Just a little bit to think about. Um, then we won't have a lot of these issues we're dealing with and a lot of bandwidth issues too. So if you process as much as possible on the device itself, we have the power to do it. You can improve people's experience. So if good design 
allows you to accomplish your goals in the least amount of moves. You take away until there's nothing left to take away. You take away the moves until people get to their goal. Then Calm Technology does the exact same thing, but with the least amount of mental cost. Because that's the scarce resource, our attention, our time. The Greeks had two concepts of time, chronos or linear time, industrial time, the meeting 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. time, and then kairos time, which is the time outside of time, the time that you lose track, the time of a sunset, the time of falling in love, the time of listening to really good music. When we have these things in our pockets that alert us constantly, we are forced always into chronos time, and we forget that it's in kairos time that we come up with all of these weird ideas and the beauty and the weirdness and the craziness of humans shows up. That's the time we need to conserve. That's the time we need to take back. That's kind of the idea behind the notion of the movement of time well spent. Turn your phone to airplane mode, turn your notifications off, choose when you're interacting with the technology. Don't let it take control of your brain all of the time. Uh, because a, pr a person's primary task shouldn't be computing. Unless you like computing, then definitely compute. But if you just want to do your job, it should be being human. And again, the scarce resource in the 21st century won't be technology. It will be our attention. Um, I wrote a book on this. I've been on this book tour for two years now. I was writing a book on alerts. And I thought, this is the most boring thing ever. No one cares. And then everybody started caring about alerts. The next book I'm writing is on sound, because no one cares about sound. But sound is getting really annoying. So maybe when the book comes out, people will care about sound more, and how annoying it is to work in an open office where everything is noisy. I also made a website where I took a lot of the original research from Mark Weiser and John Sealy Brown, and I put it there so you can read the original papers. They're beautiful. They're elegant. They're so easy to read. And they hold true in 1994 and 1989 as they do today. They read just like today. It's really amazing to find things that are so clear and so ahead of their time that still are exactly what we have right now. So thank you very much.